Good morning, and welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Antonio. My name is Gail Morrow, and I've been a member of First UU since 2010. I joined after moving to San Antonio from El Paso and have previously been a member of the First UU Church of Austin and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Las Cruces. I currently serve as the Vice President of our Board of Trustees and have previously enjoyed serving as a greeter on the membership committee and as the chair of our social justice committee. Our weekly worship is where we connect, share information and inspiration. To begin, let's acknowledge this geographical place where we are currently located, the home of and traditional lands of the Tonkawa and Payaya people of the Kwawiltekan Band, original and indigenous stewards of this land. This land is now San Antonio, Texas, claimed as part of the United States of America. At our church, we believe and act in a universal love that binds us in mutual care and affection, especially in our work for justice for all and for our planet. Our faith is all inclusive and all means all. If you are new to us or visiting for the first time today, we welcome you to sign in on the chat stream and fill out a visitor's card. We are happy that you are here and hope that you will join us for coffee hour after the service so that we can get to know you. Wherever you are on your life's journey, we hope you will find your place with us. First UU San Antonio community. I'm Annalise Cothran, and I am the chair of the Leadership Development Committee. One of our roles on leadership development is to fill leadership positions every year as part of our congregational commitment. And so I'm here today to request that um, you look into your time, energy, efforts, and resources to participate in church leadership. While we have several committees open for both chairing, if you're interested in leading a committee or just participating in a committee, the two that I'd like to highlight today, number one is for our board of directors. Um, we have a board of trustees and we have many open positions. And LDC is really interested in getting some new um, opportunities, new people, 
new perspectives um, represented on our board of trustees. And so we're very excited to formally request that if you are interested in serving in a board position to please reach out to us as we're looking to fill that those uh, openings. We also have an opening for worship committee, um, both in leadership and also um, just participation on the community uh, on the committee. As we know, the uh, formats of our worship services has changed quite a bit. And so there are opportunities to be innovative and creative and supporting our worship services. We have openings for stewardship as well. And LDC will also have openings if you're interested in supporting the leadership development of our beloved community. So LDC will be sending out a survey. Um, really, it's an informational form for you to indicate some areas of leadership that you might want to be connected to. If you're interested in serving on the board, if you're interested in serving on any committee, that would be the survey and form for you to fill out and get your information back to leadership development so that we can coordinate filling those positions. So included in that form will also be a list of all of the open positions um, in addition to the ones I've already spoken about today. And we hope that you'll consider this request to serve um, both your time and energy and talents for your community as we move into this next phase of um, growth and connection. Thanks so much. Good morning. My name is Kathy McFarland, and I am the Congregational Administrator of this church. I was raised in the Unitarian Universalist Church, and I have been a member here since 2017. I'm going to do the chalice lighting today. Our chalice lighting words today have a title, Let Us Rest in This Place, by Victoria Weinstein. We light this chalice in the spirit of life and love. We have gathered again out of our separateness to know that we are not alone. In our fears, we are not alone. In our work for peace and justice, we are not alone. And so we dwell in the light and warmth of this chalice willing to hold ourselves here in an immense and eternal love, which reaches between us to fill spaces and gives us the light, new vision to eyes dimmed. Namaste. We are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all are welcome as blessings and the human family lives in forgiveness and grace, whole and reconciled. We know that this aim takes work, and so we are committed to live and behave as a community in covenant. Let's recite our covenant that articulates our values and binds us together in community. You will find the words on your screen. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. To be a liberal, according to Merriam-Webster, is to be open-minded, to be free from the constraints of dogmatism and authority, to be generous, and to believe in the basic goodness of humankind. Religion can be defined as that which reconnects us to that which is ultimately important. Religious liberals are those who are connected through generosity and openness to the most important and ultimate aspects of life. And therein lies the challenge. If we are open-minded and not bound by authority, who or what decides those matters of ultimate importance? Let's look more deeply into these matters of worth today. As a way for us to connect as a community, you're invited to share a joyful event, a sorrow, 
or a concern by entering it on the chat stream. Please let us know what is in your heart, for ours is a welcoming community where we find connection, a spiritual community where we come fully alive. Ours is a sharing community where our joys are amplified and our cares are heard and held in compassion. At this time of uncertainty, may we listen more deeply and grow more involved and connected to each other. Let's join now in silent meditation as we write our joys and sorrows on the chat stream while Jaime plays our meditation music. Take a deep cleansing breath and exhale. For all our joys, sorrows, and concerns, may we feel empathy and compassion. And for all that is unspoken, may the caring of our community offer a space of deep kindness, loving, and just action. I'd like to share this prayerful reflection from the Reverend Daniel Cantor, Senior Minister of First Unitarian Dallas. God of many names and mystery beyond our naming, persist in guiding us to a quiet measure of this moment, that we might link heart to heart in the stillness and calm leaving behind all scurrying and fury, rush and contempt for the shore of this quiet moment. We who gather together today, coming from many corners of the land, join in breath over breath, so that we might hold the suffering and care for the morning and celebrate with the joyful. Today, we pray over those in our midst who struggle, and we appreciate those who have enough spirit to give and share today. We pray in the names of all those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten. We pray in the names of all helpers of humankind. Amen. Good morning. In today's service, you will hear about the five smooth stones of religious liberalism. Well, I'm going to tell you about a slightly different angle on what Unitarian Universalists believe. Two Unitarian Universalist ministers, the Reverends Nancy Bowen and Mike Moran, talk about the five jagged rocks of Unitarian Universalism. Some of the ideas are very much like those of the five smooth stones, and some are a little different. Why jagged rocks? Well, one idea is that the path of Unitarian Universalism isn't always smooth like 
a smooth stone. Sometimes it's rough and challenging like a jagged rock. Well, I know you're probably anxious to hear what these ideas are, so I won't make you wait any longer. The first jagged rock is, there is a unity that makes us one. One thing this means is that we should be looking out for the good of all people and other creatures in the planet too, because our own well-being is tied up with the well-being of other people, creatures, the planet, and the universe. Have you ever seen another person be sad or, or treated badly or be sad or cry? If you did, I bet you wanted to help that person because it's hard to be happy when people or creatures around us are sad. The second jagged rock is all souls are sacred and worthy. Sometimes you might hear someone say that one person is not as good as another person because of the color of their skin or which class they're in, or because they're not boyish enough or not girlish enough, or for lots and lots of other reasons. We Unitarian Universalists believe everyone is important and valuable. In fact, we celebrate the fact that people can be so different from one another. Third, you use believe in salvation in this life. You may have friends who talk about going to heaven when they die, and that's okay for them. But you use, don't think so much about going to a different place called heaven after we've lived our lives. You use want to work to make this life we have right here now on earth the best it can be. We try to make this world as much like heaven as we can make it. The fourth jagged rock is courageous love transforms the world. Have you ever seen another person be bullied? or a creature being mistreated, what did you do? Whatever you did, I bet you know that stepping in and helping the person or creature would have taken a lot of courage. It can be scary to do what you know is right, but you use value people and creatures and work to make this world the best it can be. And we know that sometimes we have to be brave to do that. Finally, Unitarian Universalists believe that truth continues to be revealed to us. This means that we are always trying to learn and grow. This is one reason why we don't have one book that we look to for truth. We look to lots and lots of books. And not just books, but all the many ways we learn things. One thing you may have noticed about all of these rocky, jagged ideas is that they're not just about what you use, think, or believe. They're about how we're supposed to act in the world, respecting each other, taking care of each other in the here and now, always being willing to learn new things, and being willing to change as we learn. Blessed be. It's now time for our offertory. The offering is the sacrament of the free church. It's supported by the voluntary generosity of all who join us. The offering will now be given and received in grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values. You may make an offering on our online giving portal through the link on the screen while we enjoy our musical anthem from Amelia and Bill Wesney. When all the world is a hopeless jumble and the raindrops tumble all around, heaven opens.
I'd like to accept our offerings by sharing with you a poem by the 1913 Nobel Literature Laureate Rabindranath Tagore, entitled Gitanjali No. 69. The same stream of life that runs through my veins day and night runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death in ebb and flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life and my pride is from the life throb of ages, dancing in my blood this moment. And so it is. Today's message is entitled, The Five Smooth Stones of Liberal Religion. I like to think of them alongside the six sources of our living tradition, and our, for now, seven principles, five, six, and seven. The five smooth stones of liberal religion. The Hebrew Bible tells the story of the young Israelite David, 
who slew the fearsome Philistine giant Goliath in one-on-one -on -one combat with his weapons of five smooth stones and a sling. The small stones turned out to be powerful ammunition. They would have been swifter, more aerodynamic, and accurate than rough or jagged stones, which are more like our own doubts, fears, and challenges in practicing our living tradition. Smooth stones represent commitment, intention, and boldness. Let's ask this question. What holds us together as a liberal religion of commitment, intention, and boldness? To begin, we turn to the work of Unitarian scholar James Luther Adams, who is important for those of us who care about the faith and the fate of liberalism, both liberal religion and liberal democracy alike especially in this age of anxiety and divisiveness. From 1937 until close to his death in 1994, Adams was a consummate teacher at both the UU Divinity Schools at Harvard and Chicago's Meadville Lombard. He illustrates his pedagogy with stories about an intimate late-night dialogue with an old friend on an important concern, the meaning of human existence. He relates this inquiry to his conception of, of theology itself, namely as a recognition of the intimate and the ultimate, and their meaning in our personal and social existence. Through his life and work, we gain some sense of the man's charisma. Charisma, one of the basic forms of human power. To set the stage for today's exploration, let me tell you the story about James Luther Adams in his own words. He says, I would start off the story by using a phrase that needs slight expansion. The principal things that concern me are intimacy and ultimacy. The intimate is not an adequate term because I'm concerned not only with interpersonal relations, but with meaningful human fellowship, with the human drive for relationship. Aristotle said that the human being is an associated being and associating being, a relational being. The quality of one's associations or relationships determines the character and the meaning of one's existence. Adams continues, the ultimate, on the other hand, is difficult to articulate in our day. For we live in a time when the ancient myths and the ancient vocabularies are anachronistic. They're not properly understood in today's society. I would call the ultimate the transcendent, but that is not an absolute indispensable way of speaking about the ultimate. You see, I was influenced in my youth by reading the autobiography of George Gordon. He was a miner's son who, without the normal prerequisites, was admitted to Harvard College as a special student rather than one who enrolls in formal academic studies for a degree. In fact, I believe he's the only person in the history of Harvard who was actually given a degree by acclamation of the faculty after only two years. Gordon tells his story of studying Greek and coming in with his blue book for a midterm exam. Professor William Goodwin said, you're not permitted to take the exam, Gordon. You're a special student. But Gordon retorted, but I'd like to take it. No, no, the professor said, you're not getting credit. You don't need to take it. 
But Gordon protested. You make me feel like an idiot, like I'm not even worth being examined. Finally, Dr. Goodwin relented and let him take the exam, which he aced. George Gordon concludes his story by saying, the meaning of living human existence is to live in a community where there are standards, where there's approval based on standards. If you don't live in a community where there's a shared sense of standards, the ult and ultimately higher standards of the divine, then you're not on the way to becoming truly human. You see, theology is faith-seeking understanding, understanding of yourself and understanding of reality. That story is an illustration of Adams's own words describing his theology of intimacy and ultimacy. Well, then how do his words guide us in navigating our liberal religion? The first smooth stone of our liberal religion is that revelation and truth are continuous. That means our religion is always a work in process, evolving, drawing deeply from our rich tradition, but not limited to it. What does this mean for you, and how can you be a better transmitter of truth and meaning? In the Bible, Jesus taught that the kingdom of God was emerging in history now. Gandhi, Dr. King, began their revolutionary work with the image of the kingdom of God. Yet because they were progressive and forward-looking, they also saw it as an archaic, patriarchal way of expressing modern life and preferred to give the kingdom of God the name the Beloved Community. Building the Beloved Community is our UU way of expressing our revolutionary and transformative aim. And to fulfill this ideal, we must pay attention to what is going on in the world now, not only what happened in the past or what we can hope for in the future. The second smooth touchstone has more to do with our specific UU church. All relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. We freely choose to enter into relationship with one another. Unitarian Universalism is a voluntary associate, association of autonomous congregations, and the way we govern ourselves is by the democratic process. Our congregations vote to call their ministers, and we have no bishop or other higher authority that tells us what to do. We strive to find a balance between considering the interests and good of the community and our own treasured individualism. Such voluntary associations are a medium for the assumption of civic responsibility. What kind of congregation do you find in us? And what do you want us to become? Are we a voluntary associate, association that attends to the psychological and spiritual well-being of all its members, as well as to the organization and direction of their collective behavior for promoting social, political, and economic change in our wider world? That's a tall order. Voluntary associations for James Luther Adams are organizations to which we freely have chosen to belong, rather than to those into which we have been born, such as through our birth family, community, and political state. In voluntary associations, Adams insists, we gain the power to negotiate our own internal feelings with others and to gain our power as a group 
to negotiate changes in the non-voluntary associations that often rule our lives. I am watching our congregation develop into a community of communities, precisely because our theology and polity, the differing ways that we conceive of God and how we govern ourselves, are so varied. And through these behaviors, we're developing communities that represent the beliefs and practices of diverse groups within our larger umbrella community. We are hence becoming a community of communities. The next stone, number three, affirms the moral obligation to direct our efforts toward the establishment of a just and loving community. It is this which makes the role of the prophet central and indispensable in liberalism. Prophets, especially in the old Hebrew Bible sense, were given the mission, the mission to call the community into consciousness and to the accountability that conscience requires. Adams says, when I entered the Unitarian ministry, I became increasingly distressed, a feeling occasioned not only by Unitarianism, but by liberalism in general, by what I called a divisive individualism, the claim that religious authenticity depends upon your individual freedoms. This raised the question in me, what is the basis for community? And for me, what is the basis for our community at First UU San Antonio? We affirm that love is the doctrine of this church and service is its prayer. We may, however, disagree on what that means to be a loving community or even a just one. We need a lot of conversations about these topics on creating our way to be an ideal a beloved community. Love and justice are meant to change us, not only as individuals, but as a community, so that together we may bring change to our world. For me, when I left home and my family of origin at age 13 to attend boarding school, I entered into a realm of community with more than 400 students and 50 faculty and administration people, and that was new for me. And I did that for four years of high school, four years of college, and six years of grad school. I live primarily in community, answering to a larger frame of reference than a nuclear family. No wonder I'm committed to building the beloved community here at our first UU Church of San Antonio. Community is where I find enough diversity and the ability to cultivate a curiosity of getting to know others as we can also be known. The fourth stone affirms the necessity of social incarnation. The good must be consciously given form and power within history, within this world this now world. Good things don't just happen. People make them happen. We must have the agency as people to make these things happen. You've heard it said, faith without works is dead. Real spirituality is about behavior and action. It is lived every day in everything we do the active nurturing we give and receive in our community fuels our lives and the lives of the greater communities to which we belong and seek to influence. The fifth and final stone is this. The resources, divine and human, that are available for achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. There is hope in the ultimate abundance of the universe. We have hope, 
Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but it's the certainty that it makes sense regardless of how it turns out. As the desiderata says, whether or not it's clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. That is something to hope for. We have hope in that. Let's remember the five smooth stones if and when we lose our bearings. They help us with the question, what holds us together in community? And they remind us to answer with commitment, intention, and boldness. May it be so. Our benediction comes from poet and philosopher Mark Nepo. He writes, the Lebanese greeting, Ya Ayuni, literally means, Oh my eyes, or, Oh my darling. Implicit in this ancient greeting is the recognition that we need each other to see that one view is insufficient. Empowered by the presence of each other, the Lebanese people say, Oh my eyes, you're here. Now I can see. This custom reminds me of how Native American elders meet in a circle, not just for equity, but so that each elder will have a direct view of the center. The belief at the heart of this worldview is that the center and the whole are not comprehensible by any one person alone. Therefore, we need everyone's view to glimpse the enduring truths of life. And so we gather meaning. We don't choose it. Like the Xian, the mythical bird of ancient China that has only one eye and one wing, we must find each other in order to see with more than one eye and to fly with more than one wing. Ya, Ayuni, O oh my eyes, you're here, now we can see. The joyous practice of this custom that we sorely need to enliven today is so welcome and to welcome others' views in the belief that we need each other to be complete. May it be so. Please enjoy our postlude from Jaime and the final moments to enter your expression on the chat stream. For those of you willing and available for some sharing during coffee hour, we welcome you to remain. And for those of you leaving us, we wish you well. We thank you for being here. Please go forward in safety, care, hope, and the vision of a brighter future. We are happy you joined with us and look forward to hearing from you soon.